Well, on the subject of uh, state level action, uh, that that brings up another recent article that you recently co-authored, uh, which appears in The Intercept. Uh, in this article, you sort of look at a very ambitious climate bill that uh, was sent to the New York State Legislature. It's called the Build Public Renewables Act, and unfortunately, um, it recently died in the in the legislature, uh, despite, of course, a big push from you know. Uh, sort of left and progressive climate groups. Mm -hmm. uh, and and uh, I, I encourage everybody to check out that article and we'll link that below. Um, and, but I, I just want to get your thoughts on um, what happened, right? Because I think that there are some interesting parallels between what happened in New York and what's kind of continuing to happen at the federal level. So maybe just to begin, what was in this climate bill uh, that, that stalled in the New York State Legislature? And why mm -hmm. did it fail at the last minute, despite, you know, heavy, heavy support from what we might call the climate left? <clears throat> so the bill itself, I would say, is a really brilliant idea, which is to take there, there's a the largest public utility at the state level in the country is in New York State. It's called the New York Power Authority. It was set up by our, our friend uh, FDR when he was governor of New York State. And um, it really, you know, got him into the elect public power electricity game uh, right before he became president and, and really inspired him to do that thing at the national level in much more ambitious ways. Um, so the bill would empower what's called NIPA, or the New York Power Authority, to build um, renewable energy all across the state. Um, now, there, there's a lot of, you know, the, the advocates will claim that the bill um, had the vote. So it passed the Senate uh, mm -hmm. in New York, and then it, they will claim it had the votes to pass in the Assembly. The Speaker of the House, um, Carl Heasty, uh uh, says that's not true, but it's contested. So right. they claim they've they've counted the votes and they have, I think they need something like 75 and they have like 83. So, but for whatever reason, Carl did not bring it to vote. So it just died with the legislative session. And they're pushing very strongly now for the legislature to do a special session this week to pass it um, on the banner of climate emergency. So there's... Um, a lot of a lot of issues that we bring up with it. Um, one is we we argue that a lot of the activism you can actually link it to this this critique of ultra leftism that I was talking about earlier. It's really a lot of the activism around it really centers this moral discourse of um, there's a slogan for the the bill called build or burn. <laughs> and if we don't build these renewables, we're all going to burn. And there's a lot of like really scary rhetoric about like the climate crisis killing us all. But what ultimately what public power is about, we argue, is transforming an industrial production system that's extremely complicated and and um, and it involves a lot of workers that run this complex electrical system that not only involves generation plants and uh, the generation of electricity, but huge transmission lines and then those connect with these distribution systems and substations it's an extra incredibly complex industrial production system and we argue that if we're socialists we really have to build a coalition that puts the workers in that system at the core of the coalition and and therefore and and we cite uh, you've talked on this program with paul prescott and lee phillips about Examples in Illinois and Maine and um, Rhode Island recently that have really centered unions, industrial unions, in the construction of climate policy that really um, puts them at the at the helm of policy construction and advocacy. That is not how this public power coalition constructed itself. It it took what I call or what we call the NGO path. <laughs> so they they really put together a coalition that we should be clear, first and foremost, is somewhat heroically made up of the volunteer labor of DSA chapters, including, I got to be clear, I organized on this coalition for uh, nearly a couple years. Mm -hmm. So it's basically DSA chapters all across the state. But the core um, organizations in the coalition are, energy, are, are NGOs in the green sector. So uh, ones like Alliance for the Green Economy, mm -hmm. um, uh, the Energy Democracy Alliance, uh, we act for 
environmental justice, which just got a cool six million dollar dollars mm-hmm. from the uh, Bezos Earth Fund, I think it's called. <laughs> um, so these are the core organizations driving the coalition that wrote the legislation and that are driving this movement. Mm-hmm. The problem is this NGO coalition has had a long history of butting heads with the unions in the electric sector and just in the industrial unions more broadly. And so the, the legislation got wrote in a way that, you know, we want NIPA to build clean energy, but only renewable energy. So if you want a, 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 a kind of parallel that ultra leftism, that in the climate movement, there's this ultra left demand for 100% renewable energy, which is actually really difficult to achieve. And any energy expert and analyst would tell you that's really hard to do. Um, and, 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 but this legislation only empowers NIPA to build renewable energy, like solar and wind. And um, it excludes the development of other types of clean energy like nuclear. And all these NGOs were part and parcel of a movement to close down Indian Point which has led to an increase in emissions in New York state. And all these NGOs are very hostile to any kind of other technologies that aren't windmills and solar panels. And so an original version of the legislation even excluded something called green hydrogen, which is using renewable energy or clean energy to make hydrogen, which can be used as storage when the sun isn't shining and the wind isn't blowing. And and because it's a very industrial process, I think they they said, we're not gonna do that either. And so it's this extremely narrow, rigid, technical uh, vision of solar and wind or nothing else. And so, of course, that is going to alienate the unions who always are going to say we need a mix of technologies. We need things like um, nuclear. We need things like even carbon capture on something like a natural gas plant would sound horrific to any environmentalists. But unions support this because they know natural gas plants are big centers of, of good union paying jobs. And, and, and if we can find technical ways to keep those jobs and to keep those um, centralized power plants in, in business, that makes sense from a union perspective. And they do want to develop uh, other advanced things like geothermal or different, different kind of new nuclear technologies. And so um, essentially uh, the, the coalition, um, it, like I said, it took the NGO path from the start and therefore sort of set up a movement that was going to inherently alienate itself from the unions. And so lo and behold, there was a public hearing on it last week, which actually happened after we wrote our article. Hmm. And and lo and behold, they had three union speakers. All three of them opposed it. <laughs> and they and the, and and they argued, um, you know, for one, they argued that NIPA is a horrible bargainer for workers. And they know, because they actually have members that know. And so, like, they just brought up very basic things that they would object to in this legislation um, that really could could have been useful at the time the legislation was was actually written. And so, um, and so there's, it's very clear there's this very big disconnect happening yeah. between um, the unions who do the work in the system and understand it to a much higher degree. And then this kind of like um, climate activist sort of build or burn kind of morality play that, that you know, I think if we're socialists, we, we have to lean more towards the other thing. If I could say one more thing, it's very clear also that the people that wrote the legislation don't have a very clear understanding um, of how, how our deregulated market system works in New York State and how difficult it would be for NIPA to actually compete with private renewable producers. And um, there's a whole lot of complicated reasons I can get to as to why, but the point is that like, not only do they ignore unions, they kind of ignore a kind of larger industrial expertise about how these systems work, Mm -hmm. how the markets work and how you could effectively intervene in them to decarbonize the the grid. And so there's a real, uh, so we argue that uh, a winning coalition would really center unions but also kind of more even wonky industrial engineers and electricity market <laughs> experts who actually understand these systems. Because I think that's a very basic thing Marxists need to, to say, that if we want to transform the relations of production, we better understand those production systems really well. 
because that's the basis to, to really changing them and transforming them. If you like this video from The Jacobin Show, please hit like and subscribe and share with your friends. Thanks.